am an organizer of social justice and mutual aid projects. Uh, I'm also co-founder of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, which is an anti-repression organization, which tries to protect the rights of people to protest and counteract the harms that come from uh, political prosecution, uh, such as jailing and malicious prosecution. Uh, I am also a, one of the defendants in the ongoing RICO case that's being brought against many different activists and organizers who have been involved in the movement opposing Cop City. Um, so first, uh, so I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, and first, can I just get a show of hands of how many people showed up to an earlier uh, earlier panel discussion on Cop City and uh, the repression of Cop City um, protesters earlier that I was a moderator of? Can we see a show of hands? Great. Okay. So this won't be a rehash for too many of y'all. That's great. Um, so the first question I want to start with uh, is kind of where we're uh, where we were at in terms of repression, the repression of current groups and movements in the city of Atlanta and in Georgia, to, to our knowledge. Um, obviously, we'll be focusing a little bit at the beginning on Cop City. Um, so if, if we can hear, uh, especially from Marlon, um, but the rest of the panelists as well, on some of the current repression um, that these uh, movements are seeing. And if you want to briefly synopsize um, the, the, the reasons for the and you can feel free to, but um, let's stick to the focus on the repression bit. Sure. So uh, to give a, a bit of a historical timeline, um, the Atlanta Solidarity Fund has been operating in Atlanta since 2016. Um, we've provided support to um, a broad array of different types of activists uh, protesting about different issues of social justice, um, protests against uh, white supremacists, protests for environmental justice and indigenous rights, um, protests against racist police violence, especially uh, in 2020. Um, over the course of these many movements, we've seen a variety of methods that the authorities, that is um, city managers and the police department, use to try to suppress and control protest movements. Um, the biggest one that we see is um, kind of uh, occasional arrests being made of people participating in like large rallies or marches. Um, and just to, to quickly trace a, a general arc, we've been seeing a dramatic escalation of protest repression over the past, say, four years, starting in 2020. Um, and also coinciding with the development of the movement against Cop City. Um, so we've seen uh, police begin to use uh, mass arrests against protesters, um, chemical weapons like tear gas and pepper spray kind of indiscriminately against crowds of people um, in order to get them to just disperse, uh, to stop doing whatever they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, moving forward along in the kind of timeline of the movement against Cop City, uh, when when those kinds of like mass arrests and kind of indiscriminate violence uh, failed to suppress that movement, you know, failed to dampen the participation of protesters. Uh, we saw police introduce um, more aggressive repression methods, um, particularly the use of domestic terrorism charges um, against political protesters, um, the murder of political activists. Uh, you know, Emmanuel Tortuguita was killed in the forest uh, while protesting against Cop City. Um, and the use of conspiracy framing and uh, RICO charges in particular as a way of broadening the net to target uh, many different people um, who, are, who could be accused of being associated with a, a protest movement, uh, regardless of kind of what they had personally done. Uh, and that's kind of where we are today, is that we're looking at a situation in Georgia where um, not only extreme charges are being used against activists to sort of terrify them out of exercising their rights, um, but also frameworks of conspiracy are being used um, to create anxiety about the notion of being associated with people who are accused of things like terrorism. 
Yeah, so I, I think there are like multiple genres of intimidation, all of which have the same purpose, which is to get people too afraid to go out and exercise their constitutionally protected right to protest. They want to make you so afraid that you won't go out and do that. And so one is the physical intimidation, the tear gas. You won't go to a protest because you know you're going to get roughed up. You know you're going to get kettled. You might get arrested. The other is obviously the legal intimidation, which is if you get a road arrested, a, if you get arrested at a protest, fear that you might end up with you know charges looking at 20 25 years in prison and the last is the technological intimidation it's the idea that that specifically in atlanta there is such a buildup of surveillance technology that you are afraid to go to protest because you know that without a doubt your presence there will be recorded for all time uh, and there are a tremendous amount of tools that the APD have at their disposal to do exactly that. So you know when you go to a protest, either by your face or your license plate or your cell phone, or your social media, somehow or other, just by attending, you are going to wind up on a list that the APD has that makes you vulnerable toward uh, police retaliation and retribution in the future. And just knowing that you will be known is a form of intimidation. It is a technological form of intimidation that's going to keep people, that's going to chill that First Amendment protected right to go out and protest. And that is something we've seen in Atlanta in huge, huge percentages. When we look at, uh, for instance, you know, the indictments against Stop Cop City at slash Defend the Atlanta Forest, you see a lot of language that they use when they're trying to paint the defendants with a uh, broad stroke uh, negative picture in the descriptions of their technologies uh, being used, for instance, Signal and Tor. And, um, you know, the usage of Tor, uh, you know, itself being this kind of incriminating, uh, nefarious purpose that you only use it if you're a criminal anyway, right? So, um, you know, the same with Signal, you can, you know, this allows you to, to communicate in, I think it was a, it was a phrasing, it was like a, a in, a, you know, uh, out of reach or in in dark, uh, dark kind of uh, alcoves of the internet, or something like that. It was it was just very bombastic language that they use to describe these technologies, um, and you know, in the effort of painting defendants uh, with a uh, broad stroke uh, as you know using these technologies for those nefarious nefarious purposes, and that's kind of you know also um, in vilifying the technologies themselves. So, so yeah, you, you see that uh, a lot in the indictments that have been, you know, filed against those defendants. Signal is a uh, nonprofit foundation run texting and calling app. Uh, we, e EFF doesn't um, endorse any specific software. However, I am not wearing my EFF hat at the moment. It is the only way that uh, any of my friends and family generally are allowed to text. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. <laughs> Use Signal. I'll say it. Yeah. There you um, go. I mean, there's uh, a lot uh, of that of things that are internet encrypted, but the signal itself has the most sensible defaults to communicate in a way that once you install it, you don't have to modify your settings very much in order to get the best assurances of having a secure communication. Uh, I'll add um, on the flip side of this that uh, you know, you know, in terms of the surveillance threat from protest. Um, those those who have not taken precautions to protect their identity while protesting, you know, who, who have not used Signal, who have not been careful with their exposure in the media and social media, et cetera. Um, particularly in 2020, we found that those people were at much higher risk for being targeted and hit with extreme charges um, for things as simple as uh, being in a photograph in front of a police car that had been vandalized. Um, you know, a police were using tactics like crawling social media for pictures like that, running them through facial recognition databases to see if they could identify who that person was, and then hitting them with like extreme, uh, you know, felony charges, uh, alleging that they had committed these acts. Um, so it, it really is, uh, it's not a theoretical question of, of whether these uh, privacy technologies help to protect people's right to protest, they're actively being criminalized. One thing I'll add is that the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law recently had a public records request which yielded hundreds of emails from inside the uh, Atlanta Police Department about their suppression of the Cop City movement. Um, and what they found was that they were watching diligently 
the social media accounts of like dozens of people who were even tangentially related to this movement. So, you know, we, we saw emails where they were like monitoring social media invites to pizza parties and to reading groups and to book clubs and to like canvassing events to try to get Stop Cop City on the ballot in Atlanta. And so, you know, this is a very real thing they were doing and, and something that is theoretically unconstitutional. You cannot watch people's social media platforms for the purpose of police surveillance purely because of their politics. And yet we know that's exactly what was happening. Um, and, and so this is I mean, a complicated issue because as somebody brought up last panel, social media is just out there, it's public. And yet, supposedly we have this protection that they cannot monitor your social media account just because of what your political affiliation is and use that as kind of police surveillance. So we're going to talk a little bit at, uh, in a minute about some of the new legislation that has been passed and some of the possible future legislation um, and then how this kind of like ch what the chilling effect of this kind of repression is um, and how we can protect ourselves. But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit and, and get some some uh, more response on some of the kinds of charges. So I'll speak uh, a little bit to terrorism charges. If terrorism is in your charge, um, then uh, local law enforcement or state law enforcement, whoever is prosecuting you, uh, feeds that into their local fusion center. And fusion centers are kind of a, a uh, compendium of all levels of law enforcement agencies that each state has uh, that then sends that information back to the feds and kind of is the information sharing hub for local, state, and law, uh, federal law enforcement. And so if you get a terrorism charge, even if you have not been convicted, and trust me, I know what I'm saying about this, uh, then you will, they will bring that to the Fusion Center, send that to Washington, to the DOJ and DHS, and then they will send that out to all 50 states, and you are now essentially on the terrorism watch list. The terrorism watch list is not the same thing as, for example, the no-fly list. You'll be able to fly, but you will have a little bit of extra attention when you're going through, for example, customs, if you went in or out of, of uh, the United States. Um, but it will also, you know, lead to certain other kinds of chilling effects on your ability to uh, seek employment. Um, and you are not removed from it if you are found innocent, if you're uh, acquitted, or if the charges are dropped against you. So the terrorism charges can be a fairly frightening, but you can also, believe me on this, still live your life and still be a dissident as much as you want. Um, Marlon, can you talk a little bit more about the RICO charges as well and kind of how they're structured and what, what that means for, uh, for protesters and activists in Georgia? Sure. So RICO is a prosecutorial framework that was you know, introduced into law originally as a strategy to take down organized crime, um, like, like, mafia fam like mafia organizations, for example. Um, and the, the premise behind the prosecutorial framework is if you have an organized criminal enterprise, you're not going to be able to point to the guy at the very top of the pyramid and uh, and and see him committing murders or you know selling drugs or doing any of the things that the organization yeah, committing any of the crimes that the organization commits. Um, and and Rico allows prosecutors to say we are going to charge the kingpin of this organization and all of his lieutenants and all of the people who gave the orders to sell the drugs or commit the murders or you know do the heinous crimes we will we we can charge all of those people with those crimes by virtue of the fact that they are all part of a coordinated organization that you know passes down orders and operates you know to commit the crimes this is the premise behind rico this is how uh, society was sold rico um what it actually does what, what it actually allows prosecutors to do is take any people could be two people you know two or three people um and argue that since they have some kind of association uh that if one of them committed a crime that the others are also guilty of that crime because they are associated with each other um and the you know the definition or the degree to which they have to be associated is like left very widely open to interpretation um, and that's what gets us to the place that we are now, where uh, the Georgia Attorney General is alleging that um, sort of just kind of like a, a grab bag of political activists and legal observers and, and NGO organizations 
are all guilty of being part of a supposed criminal organization whose purpose is to stop the construction of Cop City. Um, in, in fact, this is just an assortment of activists, organizers, community members who all generally have the same political beliefs. They all don't want Cop City to happen. Um, and the construction of a RICO style criminal organization based on political beliefs uh, gives prosecutors the tool that they need to basically perform an end run around the First Amendment. Say, OK, we can't we can't overtly criminalize you for protesting or for opposing public policy. Um, but we can criminalize you for being allegedly part of an association that has certain beliefs. Uh, that, that, that is the, the playbook that um, uh, state authorities in Georgia and some other states are attempting to develop now as a tool for combating kind of any protest movement that comes around, regardless of what the issue is. Um, this is a tool that they can use to simply criminalize anybody who comes out onto the streets and protests as being part of a criminal organized group. Well, you might be a part of a conspiracy of two or more people. <laughs> Perish the thought. So, um, so, you know, that's, that's a lot, that's a big part of it, but it's happening from the state level. The county uh, prosecutors actually dropped the charges um, because they, they said that they didn't have a, a philosophical agreement with the state AG over these prosecutions, signaling their, this was their way of saying that this, they viewed these as political prosecutions and these charges as political. Um, a lot of the the work uh, that that you do is with the Solidarity Bail Fund, um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, state attempts to kind of criminalize it, or you know what that looks like um, uh, on the ground floor. So the work that the the kind of central work that the Atlanta Solidarity Fund does is we make sure that if protesters are arrested as a result of participating in some kind of political protest, um, and they're put in jail and they're given charges, generally bogus charges, that they have the ability to defend themselves, that they're protected against the kind of harms that come from that process. Because we recognize that when it comes to protest, uh, when it comes to the repression of protest, the process is the punishment, right. right? You can go to a protest, you can get arrested, put in jail, charged with some bullshit thing, and you can end up going through court and have your charges thrown out because the cops never had the right to do any of that stuff to you. But by the end of that process, you've already been punished, right? Like all of the hassle, all of the harm that comes from going through the jail system, going through the court system, all of those things can't be undone. Um, so the work that the Solidarity Fund does is we make sure that if protesters are locked up, they have access to assistance getting bailed out. If they're being charged with something, they have access to lawyers who are able to adequately you know, argue for their defense. Um, this is very unpopular with law enforcement and with prosecutors in Georgia and apparently with the state legislature because uh, last year a law was passed specifically outlawing the work that we do. Uh, the, the, the bill did not name us by name, but it's like they kind of all but named us by, you know, all but named us, um, making it illegal to operate a charitable bail fund in Georgia. Um, this is concerning for a lot of different reasons, you know, most obviously because it seems like it means the authorities are weaponizing the bail system specifically as a way to control protest kind of extra legally, like without having to prove their cases in court and like present evidence against activists. They're looking for ways that they can bring as much pain to them as possible before having to go to trial. Um, and, and it is unconstitutional, um, which is why it is being challenged by the ACLU as we speak. Um, this law is currently suspended uh, because we've won a pre preliminary injunction against it, um, which is why we are able to continue doing the work that we're doing today. And with luck, we will continue doing this work forever. And by bail fund, you mean, you know, basically any group of people that puts their funds together in order to provide bail to a defendant? Yeah, I mean, uh, not only our organization is affected by this, you know, if you're uh, if you're a church and you want to, you know, help to bail out one of your church members, 
uh, and you pass the plate to collect funds to post their bail, uh, you would be in violation of the law. I mean, the civil rights movement would not have been possible without people being able to raise money to collectively to bail out all the people that were being arrested in sit-ins. So. Uh, yeah, and, you know, this is this is obviously uh, a way also of attempting to, to you know, weed working class people and people who don't have means because the bail system generally is meant to privilege wealthy people who can bail themselves out uh, at the expense of working class people who are lower income. So, um, so I was wondering if, if there are there other kinds of uh, legislation, I have a couple um, that I could speak on, but are there other kinds of legislation that have currently been passed, been signed into law that are affecting uh, protest in Georgia? In Georgia, I mean, some of the big ones that I've been following, not necessarily in Georgia, but across the, the not just the South, the country, one is the anti-masking mandates, uh, which in a lot of states now, it is illegal just to wear a, you know, a pharmaceutical mask, a medical mask at a protest, which if you consider the fact that we've, you know, we're, we're still in the midst of a pandemic in which you don't necessarily like, want to be in a crowd with, uh, at a protest without wearing a, a mask, um, that's a crime now in some states um, for concealing your identity, which you should want to do at a protest anyway because of the proliferation of face recognition anyway. Um, the other one that I think is a, a huge, huge intimidating factor for people going out protesting is that in many states now it is illegal for people in their cars to run over protesters if they feel boxed in, um, which is which is hugely has a huge chilling effect on people who want to go out and do marches which are gonna be in the street right this is this was originally started in north dakota against indigenous water protectors um who were fighting against uh attempts to build pipelines um that can that did you know are contaminating um their water sources um so a couple of the other pieces of legislation that have been signed and have been passed and signed into law um are uh, hb 30 which was a redefinition in the state of georgia on anti-semitism what they did was they they did something that a, a number of attempt uh, of state governments and city governments that are attempting to suppress the the free palestine movement um have attempted to do which is redefine anti-semitism according to the international holocaust remembrance um, associations uh, definition, which is not the definition that I, as a Jewish person, many other Jewish people and Jewish organizations across the country and across the world um, accept, because it includes language, uh, for example, saying that Israel does not have a right to exist. Um, so if you say in the state of Georgia, in theory, uh, that Israel doesn't have a right to exist, you're engaging in anti-Semitism, and that therefore is uh, biased speech. I, I am on camera, and I'm going to watch my words. Uh, but I have my own opinions. Um, the other, uh, the other one in particular that was uh, passed and signed this year was uh, SB 414, the Personal Privacy Protection Act. And the Personal Privacy Protection Act uh, protects individuals who are associated with a nonprofit organization from Freedom of Information, um, uh, from public records requests and Freedom of Information Act requests to uh, government entities. So uh, kind of the reading that, that we took of this uh, to some degree was that people who are doing public records requests to uh, the Atlanta Police Department, for example, about the many myriad of ways that the nonprofit uh, Atlanta Police Foundation engages in public uh, activities, activities for government agencies, that with when you do those public records requests, at least the staff and volunteers and executives of an organization like the Atlanta Police Foundation would be protected uh, from being disseminated uh, in your public records request. So for example, an email between the, the uh, Atlanta Police um, and the APF uh, might be censored a little bit more than it would have been in the past to protect the APF. Um, you know, are there any other kinds of legislation that we see in the pipeline or that we're worried about um, or that we have currently seen passed uh, in Georgia um, to suppress? Well, government? one that I'll flag uh, that, that's not current but is just useful to, to highlight a little more is the Georgia domestic terrorism, um, which is distinct from, you know, you hear about uh, terrorism on a federal level in terms of terrorism enhancements of uh, federal felony charges. Um, Georgia has a specific felony law called domestic terrorism. It was passed in 2017. Um, 
kind of in the aftermath of the Charleston massacre, um, uh, legislatures, le legislators argued that um, there needed to be a specific law to cover cases like this. Um, the, the, the law itself uh, is, is vague in ways that are important to understand. Um, it criminalizes as terrorism any act which interferes with public infrastructure in order to pressure the government to change policy. Um, and so, so when you think about that, you could imagine that that means like, um, you know, blowing up the capital in order to, you know, ha to take over the government or something. But as uh, concerned legislators noted in 2017, it could also be used to criminalize Black Lives Matter protesters standing on the highway to protest against racist police violence, um, which is true. The legislation uh, like explicit or like implicitly cr criminalizes that. Um, the response of advocates for the legislation at that time was, well, that's ridiculous. We would never actually, no prosecutor would actually use this law in that way. But you know, don't be silly. You never take their word protections against it. Like never it. take their word for it. <laughs> Fast forward to 2023, when we see the only instance of this law ever actually being used against anybody, and it's being used against political activists who are alleged to have done nothing more than sat in trees and refused to come down when police asked them to. Um, these are the people who are being charged as domestic terrorists. So to talk a little bit about the, the kind of um, chilling effect that this has on movements. Uh, like you know, when you pass this kind of legislation or you engage in these kinds of prosecutions, when you use this kind of language in indictments um, that attempts to take normal, everyday software, for example, I text with my grandma on Signal, let's be real, um, you know, like when you, t you know, you, you kind of add these things together, what is the effect on movements and on people who want to get engaged uh, civically with uh, issues uh, here in Georgia? I think the mental effects of surveillance on the right to express yourself uh, are well documented and it, it you know results in self-censorship it results in not wanting to you know take the risk that is involved with you know social change movements i think that's something that the uh, police and the state you know very well recognizes when they enact uh, surveillance legislation because you know, is not outright criminalizing by the act of, you know, the very, you know, uh, implementation of that surveillance, but it, it, the, the effect is known, right? The effect is that that those actions won't take place, that civil disobedience won't happen as much. And, you know, that's uh, well documented in the literature, um, in mental, uh, mental health and mental, um, you know, uh, uh, research on the effects of surveillance. And um, and I think that that's something that that is a real uh, consequence that we need to kind of deal with and and as um, activists kind of move towards a uh, you know doing activism in a, in in a way that is um, aware and protecting ourselves against that surveillance, but also doesn't uh, stifle our ability to be effective. The use of terrorism also has a, a discursive effect, uh, which I think is very important, not just on kind of public sentiment or public understanding, right? Like ter terrorism is demonized, right? Like people um, have a bad reaction to that word, but it also uh, has a discursive effect within law enforcement, within police departments. Think about, you know, since 9-11, terrorists have been understood as the people who the United States government hunts and kills at any cost and with, you know, blanket justification. That is that is what it means for somebody to be a terrorist, right? Um, and so when that label begins to be applied to people domestically, uh, people, in, you know, involved in political work inside our society, what we see within law enforcement organizations is uh, is the is the increase? It's, it's sort of like a dog whistle for police violence, right? It's it's a way of designating, you know, people in our society as implicitly killable. Um, and in fact, in the cop city movement, that is what we saw. Uh, you know, an activist was killed by police who believed that the adversary that they were dealing with were terrorists, right? 
Um, and if this label continues to be used in this kind of like wanton sort of like reckless way, I predict that we will end up seeing uh, you know, more examples like this of, you know, just police violence against protesters. As, as early as 2005, you had an enhancement of the Animal Enterprise Protection Act becoming the Ani Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Federal. And that was something that was used uh, to great success by, by prosecutors uh, in New Jersey to uh, criminalize and send to a combined 22 years in prison uh, activists in the Shack 7 case where you had, um, you know, people that were simply accused of uh, publishing a website um, that was, you know, uh, letting people know about a specific animal testing laboratory with a terrible track record uh, of their practices and what they were doing as sending, you know, activists there to 20 uh, some odd years in jail in 2006. So, you know, that's um, very hot off the heels of 9-11. And so we see how quickly they're willing to turn 9-11 uh, um, kind of type actions uh, towards activists in, in the modern age. The, um, this, you, you mentioned the murder of Tortuguita by the police. Um, it reminds me because you know, usually when police engage in frivolous uh, protest arrests, they have an expression, you can beat the rap, but you can't beat the ride, which is exactly what you were talking about before. It's the situation where the costs of being arrested and going through a case, or even just being arrested, even if they dropped the charges almost immediately, um, are often enough to intimidate dis dissidents and intimidate dissent. And so there's a similar thing when you uh, when you watch what happened with the murder of Tortuguita, right? Like they started with this story, the police uh, brought forth a story. The story did not hold up to uh, to to any uh, you know uh, anyone who who paid attention. That suddenly he had a, suddenly this person had a gun and then didn't have a gun anymore. Uh, at first they were you know targeting the police and then it turned out that they were not. Their hands were up. Right, like it was very clear that they wanted to get ahead of the story very quickly by putting out, you know, kind of, this was a, this is terrorism and this was a violent individual. And when that story fell apart, well, you know, the corrections aren't in the press, the damage has already been done. Um, so I wonder if we could talk a little bit, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, various kinds of surveillance tech that they're using, that law enforcement are using against protesters. And then we're gonna talk about what we can do to protect ourselves and uh, open the floor up to Q and A. So can we talk a little bit about what are some of the kinds of surveillance tech um, that uh, Atlanta police and law enforcement in Georgia have at their disposal um, or might be coming down the pipeline? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we say that Atlanta is probably the most surveilled city in America for a number of reasons. The first is that there are so many overlapping uh, jurisdictions of surveillance in Atlanta. Um, you have the, the Atlanta Police Foundation, which has a private enterprise, which is pumping millions of dollars into buying surveillance equipment that are all kind of centralized through the real-time crime center, which has public cameras, it has private cameras. You have private police forces and private surveillance systems that cover entire neighborhoods in Atlanta. And the other thing is that because there's so much money in Atlanta, being from the foundation, from the city itself, a good portion of whose municipal budget goes to policing, uh, because you have federal grants, you have federal military equipment and surveillance equipment, the, which comes to Atlanta, all of these different overlapping ways the, a, uh, the APD can get access to surveillance equipment. Um, and, and then on top of that, uh, you have the Atlanta Police Department, which is kind of a laboratory for surveillance tech. There is almost no contractor in America selling technology to police departments that the APD has not had some kind of contract. They have contracts with two technologies, two companies that offer the same type of technology. They, they just, there's nothing they will not say no to. We have a, a tool at, a, uh, at EFF called the Atlas of Surveillance, where you can look by your own city and your town, what contracts your police department has with different surveillance vendors. And you can see Atlanta is like a huge bubble on the map because every type of technology we track, the APD has some kind of contract with. Um, and so we're talking like, Drones and robots. We're talking facial recognition, predictive policing algorithms. Um, really, everything there is automated license plate readers, uh, acoustic gunshot detection, so microphones that are on at intersections at all time, listening for loud pops, which may or may not be. Which are extremely reliable, right? Yeah, <laughs> extremely reliable. Yeah. 
Um, uh, they are not. <laughs> and and oddly enough, I mean, maybe it's because the APD is such a reliable customer. A lot of these companies are also headquartered in Atlanta too. So there's such a big uh, uh, tech surveillance presence here. Uh, and, and all of that really gets weaponized specifically, particularly at black communities, at poor communities, at immigrants, at uh, activists, Most people. At, at LGBT youth, um, but, but especially also at protesters. Any other tech that you guys want to highlight? All right. So, you know, it's scary, right? Like the terrain is sometimes kind of scary and it has actually been scary for my entire lifetime. And I think, uh, you know, much longer than that, there has been attempts to repress dissent. As long as there has been dissent, there has been dissent as long as there's been oppression. What can we do to protect ourselves? What is the other side of this story? Um, and how can we kind of either as individual activist groups, as individuals or as movements uh, kind of push back on this and protect ourselves while we're in the streets, when we go to demonstrations uh, and when we're getting active? But before we give some like specific uh, techniques and, and suggestions and some policy suggestions, first I want everybody to write down a URL, which is ssd.eff.org. That is our surveillance self-defense guide. It has guides for a number of different scenarios. If you are uh, an LGBT youth uh, who is nervous about your digital footprint, if you are crossing international border, if you are living in a state where abortion has been criminalized and want to research where to find reproductive health care. We have all these specific tailored guides for how to defend yourself from surveillance on there. But pertinent to this is we also have a very large and very thorough surveillance self-defense guide for attending a protest, which has very good and very useful tips and also a printout PDF that you can print out and fold up as a little booklet and take with you. You can print out a hundred and hand them out of the protest, but it is ssd.eff.org. I'll also mention the uh, securityeducationcompanion.org, uh, which F uh, EFF uh, created and founded. Um, we are no longer updating it. We have very recently updated a lot of the protest guide, um, ssd.eff.org against that URL, but also you can check out the securityeducationcompanion.org, which is not yet completely out of date. Do we want to go over some of the specific tips from the guide there? I mean, uh, I think that really depends on what type of demonstration you're attending and what your specific legal status is. Um, there's not really, and when we say this a lot, not really one size fits all kind of guidance for attending um, a protest or expressing your uh, your opinion. Um, and I think that one of the guides in the SSD that you can look at is uh, your uh, risk assessment and determining what level of a risk that you're willing to go to. Um, and that might involve, you know, something as simple as writing a letter to your member of Congress, uh, which is, you know, effective to some degree, um, and you should do, uh, and anyone can do. Um, and uh, we don't want to kind of uh, make this so uh, frightening that no one can do anything. That's kind of the opposite of our goal, the opposite of uh, what we want to be accomplishing here. We want to uh, have you all be safe when you're trying to express uh, your opinions and, uh, and uh, you know, possibly take the streets. Um, there are a number of tips um, there from, you know, taking a bike uh, instead of uh, a you car, know, with a license car with a license plate that can be read by an automatic license plate reader um, to, um, you know, not taking your um, physical device and, uh, you know, you could turn your um, phone into airplane mode and uh, download, for instance, something like organic maps, uh, which can pre-download uh, an entire region and you can navigate a city through that instead of having every movement of yours tracked through something like Google Maps in real time. Um, there's a, a number of tips that are, that are available in those guides. Um, but I think that, you know, all is up to you to decide what is worth it doing, because a lot of this entails a certain trade-off between usability and, uh, security. And so, you know, the more steps that you take to ensure your, uh, security than generally, but not completely, um, the, the more, uh, uh, inconvenience you're going to incur 
from taking those steps. So, you know, there might be some simple steps that you can take. Uh, I always, for instance, when I'm processing, when I'm going into airport, uh, airport security, uh, will turn my phone into basically just my iPhone, press these two buttons on the side, uh, which is volume up and power. And together, then it brings me into this menu, which um, allows me to shut off the phone or just cancel. And if I hit cancel, then it forces me to type in my full password again. And so, um, you know, airport security, for instance, can't just shove this in my face and then do face unlock. Um, so that's going to be something that, uh, you know, requires me to enter my full password every time. Should we be using fingerprint or, or face unlock? Well, you know, it depends. I think that, uh, the most secure thing that you can do is to enter a password or passphrase that's say three or four random words, uh, every time you unlock your phone. Yet yeah, that's not very usable, right? So if you're Edward Snowden, uh, uh, hands up. Who's Edward Snowden in the office? In your, yeah, uh, I've got a couple. We got a couple one. Edward Snowden. <laughs> so if you are, then you might want to uh, do that. But, um, you know, you, uh, for, for my phone, I have face unlock and I have a 13 character kind of random passphrase. And that is good enough to... Uh, basically ward a, off some of these forensic unlocking devices. So a lot of times in protest situations, uh, you will have a mass arrest uh, where everyone's devices are confiscated and they attempt to do imaging on those devices uh, in order to determine what people have installed, what messages they've been sending, what pictures they've taken, uh, all this and on a mass scale. And one of the companies that does this is a company called Gray Shift, which is based here in Atlanta. Again, another surveillance company yeah. based here in Atlanta. Um, um, yeah. So another thing is just, you know, be conscientious about, about what you post online. You know, be courteous. Talk to people at protests. Ask them if it's okay if you post a picture of their face. They might say no. Um, if, if you take photos at a protest and you like, for instance, give it to the press because you don't want to publish it on your own social media, make sure you scrub the metadata from that photo because if, if they just send out that photo, the original photo might have, you know, the address of your phone and the exact geolocation of where it was taken. So thinking about, you know, the, the digital evidence that could lead from uh, photographs of a protest back to you or back to people you know. Yeah. And respecting yeah. the consent of people's faces when you're posting them, I think so, so this is something I stress in general when I talk to activists about security is the, the, the practices of security are not something that can be uh, mastered on an individual level or rather um, your safety against surveillance is not something that you can master by yourself. Um, there are certainly practices that are useful for you for you to learn as an individual and practice as an individual but security against surveillance is a social condition that we're trying to create. And protest is a social activity. Um, we are dependent on each other um, in order to safeguard all of our security. Um, because in fact, we are all always surveilling each other, especially at an event like this. Uh, you, you can imagine how that kind of thing works um, with you know so many pictures being taken, so much metadata being relayed all the time, so many communications circulating between so many people. Uh, what we need is to develop a culture which internalizes these notions of security and internalizes a general resistance to surveillance. Um, and that means not just developing our own skills and making sure that we are all masters of our phones and computers and like experts in technical systems, but talking to each other continually and in an ongoing way about what is important to us about resisting surveillance. Um, what other people know about these systems, uh, what the latest ways are that we can protect ourselves and to protect each other, to understand what the risks are that the people around us are worried about and what we need to do to make sure that we're not putting them at risk by things which might be fine for us to do, right? Tweets that might be fine for us to send, pictures that might be fine for us to upload, emails, et cetera, um, but could be endangering somebody else who's in a more vulnerable situation. So just talking about this stuff, studying it together with other people, sharing that knowledge and spreading it is like a huge part of the puzzle. I have uh, stickers if anybody wants them that say privacy is a team sport. 
Uh, Bill, you, you had, if anybody wants to um, have any Q&A, feel free to start lining up at the, uh, the mic as well. Um, you have more to say? Yeah, just that, that um, you know, if you're, uh, you might find it laborious to type in some, you know, large passphrase in order to unlock your phone, but you might find it uh, advantageous at certain points of time. And then, you know, you can remove or force a yourself to, or someone else to uh, use that character, you know, 13 character, for instance, passphrase in certain circumstances wh where you think you might be at risk more. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of, uh, one of the, the tips I would give is that, you know, have a strong password, um, that makes it hard for something like a gray key, which is produced by gray shift or, uh, a UFED, uh, device, which is produced by Celebrite, one of these forensic imagers, um, to unlock your phone. Um, but also you might want to have, uh, a forensic or a, um, biometric unlock uh, in certain circumstances where you're not under threat of arrest. Um, and that way you can kind of uh, have it more usable in your everyday circumstances. I, I never will. Be. I, I, and the last thing I think we can do as a line of defense is we, we got to pass some policy in Atlanta in particular, but also in Georgia in general, is there is just, there is no hurdles right now between police wanting a piece of technology, using the money either from municipal budget or from the APF, buying it and using it. There's nothing stopping them from doing any of that right now. And in other cities there are, in other cities there are pieces of policy, there are face recognition bans, there are predictive policing bans, there's something we like to call CPA cops, community control over police surveillance, which is a very, very common sense, small reform that any city can do and a lot already have, in which when the police department wants to buy a new piece of tech, they have to do three things. They have to get the democratically elected city council to vote on it. They have to publish a use policy that says exactly how they're going to use it, and they have to have a public comment period so that people who object to it can come and voice their concerns and could possibly sway their city council people to vote against it. And it is such a small common sense reform that is such a big difference between the APF just having a blank check to buy and use whatever the hell they want um, and is already making a really big difference in other cities. And I think, I think in Atlanta it is doable. Even for abolitionists, I think it's useful because it does a lot, provide a lot more information to researchers and to, to movements about what is being used and what are the, the supposed use, uh, uses for these. It's an incremental step to be sure, but, but it is a first step, yeah. Thank you gentlemen for this. This has been really great. This is my first Dragon Con, so it's really yeah. nice to know that this kind of exists here. Uh, but as a student in Atlanta, um, I'm no stranger to the environment and the culture that surrounds protesting on an administrative level. And that um, kind of leaks into the student body and convinces a lot of people that either A, it's not worth it to protest or that uh, they shouldn't. And so kind of just what would you say with everything that you shared and all of the t uh, tactics and methods that you shared today, what would you say to students who are kind of maybe on the fence about protesting and being on college campuses because they might lose a scholarship or they may be doxxed, et cetera. I think, I think that that is a really, really important point. There's a couple things I want to say to that, and I'll pass it to anyone else who wants to talk on that. Um, first of all, uh, rights are a muscle that you lose if you don't flex, you know? So we, like, the more we put, we allow law enforcement agencies to push back at our ability to dissent, the less we will be able to operate in our daily lives, whether it's in a civic sense, in a protesting sense, or or um, even just kind of functioning, because they're going to pull into our lives in other ways as well. It's going to continue to affect us if we don't push back. This is a friction, and most rights are frictions in societies where you have to push back on the incremental attempt or the direct attempt to take them away from us. The other thing I just quickly want to mention is that the Atlas of Surveillance does also include uh, other kinds of uh, private contracts with, with public entities. So it'll also tell you some of the surveillance at Georgia Tech, at Georgia, Georgia State. Um, and so not just you know cities and, and state governments and their contracts. We also are always, always looking for, for researchers who can help us um, update that information. Any other thoughts on how to respond to students who are afraid? I would just say that the administrative cost of arresting and processing and, you know, putting everyone through that kind of harassment 
does is not negligible and a lot of the time when you have some mass arrest scenario and then there is this kind of solidarity call to get arrested for whatever you can then it floods the jails and it makes it so that they have to uh you know let uh, people be released uh, before uh they you know um you know, prosecute them to the full extent etc and so there is this kind of chance of using the administrative cost of of you know protesting to further our goals in that way when we have more people on board when we are able to you know uh use solidarity to the effect of of you know uh making a, basically <laughs> performing in technical terms what would be called a denial of service attack on uh, the jail system. I would point students to history. Um, I mean, students have been at the forefront of kind of every important social movement that we've seen in recent history. Um, obviously, the, the student movement in the 1960s against the war was incredibly effective, um, provided an important leadership that would not have materialized otherwise. Students were a huge force in pushing uh, against apartheid in South Africa um, and made a strong impact that worked, that was effective. If we even if we look at, at Georgia, you know, at Georgia in 2016, student mobilizations against the Klan and Stone Mountain were one of the key reasons that the KKK canceled their marches in Stone Mountain for years afterwards uh, because of the massive community outpouring. Um, Protest works. Social movements are one of the few remaining tools that ordinary powerless people who don't have money or power have to influence the direction of society. Um, and we see evidence in history that it works. And, and get organized, because regardless of RICO charges and the like, uh, the more organized we are, the more we can have each other's back because we defend us, right? Um, so I have two questions. One. Um, when it comes to other apps, you know, just games on your phone or whatever else, we, we are all aware that we are the product if it is free. Have you guys heard or seen anything in terms of governments purchasing that data to use against? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> There's a Muslim prayer app that was uh, targeted specifically for this purpose uh, and resold, uh, you know, the information from that app being resold to government and yeah there's a whole data bro you know basically uh app uh collection to data broker to government industry we eff and the associated press did a massive massive investigation into a kind of reveal to the public and a company called fog data science which buys the geolocation data from apps on your phone uh that sell it of hundreds of millions of people and what they did as a product is they packaged it all on a neat map so that police who sell who paid for subscription to Fog Data Science could draw a little square on a map and see every phone that's been in that and then trace that phone hours back. Um, and so, yes, we've seen absolutely that that is a product that police have access to and which some police even claim they didn't need a warrant to use. So, yeah, absolutely. Free apps on your phone that have access to geolocation and sell that that data might end up in the hands of a nifty app that police are using. Turn your location services off when you're playing Candy Crush. So, so there's a there's a um, a great service called Exodus uh, Privacy where you can look up uh, any number of thousands of apps and see what exact uh, application programming interfaces, a APIs that they include, uh, and see if any of them are. Um, you know, shady, or they have been seen to be delivering that data over to law enforcement um, for, uh, you know, physical, uh, you know, products. You can look at privacy not included, which Mozilla maintains, um, to look at to see if your, uh, you know, connected vacuum cleaner is delivering data on the maps of your house, those kind of things. So, so yeah, those two resources that I would uh, definitely recommend looking at Exodus privacy and privacy not included by Mozilla. Um, Nerd pro tip, uh, Graphene OS is an Android variant that allows you to sandbox applications and deprive them of access to location data, et cetera, while the app still believes that it has access to that data. Hmm. Uh, so even apps which require you to disclose location data will still operate 
but just not give your real data. That's for Android and for iOS. I would recommend turning on uh, uh, lockdown mode, which um, does something similar. If we can get the next two uh, comment or, uh, questions, because we are uh, about at time, um, we'll get you guys one and after the other, and then we'll uh, start answering those questions. Uh, so RICO laws in general have been useful for targeting organized crime, but Georgia has one of the most broad RICO laws in the country. I was wondering if there's any uh, effort to reform the legislation and specifically, uh, what sort of changes would you uh, recommend to keep the good parts while throwing out the bad parts? Last question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, scrubbing like metadata from photos. If I, for example, took a photo at a protest, went home and took a screenshot, and then sent that to press or uploaded it, would it still have the metadata from the protest or no? No, generally not. Um, and also sending it via signal to yourself is uh, an effective way to remove that metadata. Thank you. Uh, anybody want to speak to the question of RICO charges? Um, one thing I think is uh, of particular interest it, to some degree is that originally RICO charges were against for-profit uh, criminal enterprises. And so the move away from that towards clearly like you know, money losing and adventures like our various social movements, uh, that could be one way to think of it. I generally do not think RICO, uh, RICO law is good um, uh, in any event, but I think that one policy uh, direction to try to take that is to narrow it to uh, for-profit criminal enterprises, which is you know, the mafia, the gang, you know, the gangsters um, that it was originally allegedly supposed to be uh, focused on and then takes it away from looking at social movements, groups that are very clearly not, you know, profit making enterprises, um, but are people working together in civic ways for civic uh, reasons. Um, so if that's it, uh, thank you so much for coming this late on a Saturday night. I know a lot of people have parties to go to uh, throughout the con. Uh, so thank you so much to to the rest of the um, panelists, uh, and I hope that you enjoy the con. Please look into EFF.org if you're not a member. You can, of course, join EFF.org or EFA, the Electronic Frontier Alliance, if you have a group. Thank you so much.